Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ron, for that warm welcome. And I want to welcome everyone from all around the world. Always excited to be back with you here. I was excited to see that there's 1,400 people registered for this webinar. Um, as many of you are transitioning to either Agile or even understanding Agile and the value that it can provide for your organizations. So um, let's get started. Um, I think Ron did a good job giving the background. So um, all you really need to know is obviously Agile is what we live and breathe. And I do come from a technical background. So I used to be a software developer, an engineer, and an architect, both on the Java, the .NET side before. Um, I sort of fell in love with Agile and, and, and organizational transformation. So very excited to be here with you. Um, let's get started. Before we talk about the journey of the Agile life cycle, I want you to tell me if, via the chat to engage you a little bit, what problems are you running into delivering value from your projects? What are the challenges that you're even hoping Agile would begin to address for you? Uh, why are you even interested in changing the method that you're probably using today? So go ahead and submit in the chat menu the top um, challenges or sources of waste that you think your organization's facing from getting any projects done. Ambiguity, last minute changes, customer delight, rework, lack of commitment, short timelines to get projects done, lots of churn, we're working in silos, lack of resources, unclear requirements, frequent change, too many chickens <laughs> that think they're pigs, I love that. For people that know that joke, I'll have to share that with you. Lack of requirements, um, time to market is what you're looking for, good. Lack of resource commitment, unskilled workers, don't know how much we can help there, but we, uh, we have some ideas on generalizing specialists. Rigid planning, probably too much planning as opposed to getting work done. Uh, poor risk management, heavy processes, um, and scope creep. Yep, very good. Thanks for sharing that. Those are a lot of challenges, and they're real world challenges. And just to summarize them very quickly, um, and I think you've mentioned many of these, is the conflicting business priorities, um, and I know this list sounds like it's theoretical. This is really the list and what you've just shared is from the real world. This is what organizations are really struggling with day to day, conflicting business priorities, multitasking, <laughs> my opinion, and if you've been to any of my other webinars, it's the heart of all evil, which is trying to get too many projects done all at the same time by the same resources it makes them extremely ineffective. No value measurement or tracking, delivery of customer needs too late. Um, unproductive meetings, right? Just meeting for the sake of meeting, and and uh, I have uh, I'm going to do a whole webinar on this, but not not meeting to deliver value, but meeting to discuss something, and then you have to have the meetings after the meeting. Uh, no end-to-end -end process visibility or optimization. Working on not very valuable projects. Tactical focus. It's all about get it done, get it done. No time for process improvement or strategic. Uh, many of you mentioned the silos. People are working with excessive handoffs and red tape. Um, and those silos is what really causes the lack of communication, collaboration, and trust because people are so used to working in their own area, owning their own tasks, that it becomes easy to finger point and say it's the other department's fault. Uh, lack of generalizing specialist, and that's the issue where everyone's so focused on doing their own task, their own specialty, that um, they become very my task oriented. They're not willing to help with other things, and Agile will promote generalizing specialists. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, requirements, of course, right, you know, the famous garbage in, garbage out. So if I've got bad requirements, if they're missing requirements, um, then that becomes an issue. Now the problem with requirements is we've been trying to fix them from the beginning and say they can't change. And I think all of you know by now that changing requirements is the norm and it's not the exception. So in Agile, we're going to talk about how do we manage that change in a way uh, that makes sense because we can't, uh, we can't be adverse to change because that is the norm. Firefighting, being reactive to quality issues instead of being proactive. Lots of heavy documentation and processes that get in the way of delivering value and impediments all over the place and a lot of disengaged employees. So those are, when someone says, what problem are you really trying to fix? Um, there's several problems and those are the, the biggest list of the ones um, that we try to focus on the most. Uh, ultimately, what we're really trying to do is take individuals that used to work in these silos, see these little colored pods of people, and they've got all this uh, documentation and process and handoffs between each other. What we've realized over the years is that we've created functional teams that do something very well. 
developers that do really great, excellent development, or testers, or analysts, or project managers, or um, the customer unit that does claims processing, they do their job very well, but unfortunately, what it takes to actually deliver value is a cross-functional team, right? And I would challenge you to think about any team that you have, any functional team in your organization that on its own can deliver complete value without working with another team. And I think it's, it's hard to find those teams. I'm sure there's one or two that do deliver full end-to-end -end value. But most organizations find that their functional teams have to interact with other people before they can actually deliver something end-to-end. -end. So what is really Agile about then? Agile is about creating and enabling these high-performing cross-functional teams. We're going to talk about communication between these teams, collaboration, visibility, tracking, progress. How do these teams operate? And the challenge with moving to Agile uh, in general is because this is where we are today. So we have built a ton of processes that are made for silos to work with each other. And bringing people together this way, especially when they're distributed around the world, is very, very challenging. And the other thing that we've done, um, not meaning to, is the multitasking hell. The everyone's working on so many different projects at the same time. And that breaks the core focus that the team really needs to be able to get something all the way to done, done. So um, to become a high-performing organization, Agile is really just one part of the puzzle, right? And I, and I always want to talk about that because I don't want people to think that the final ultimate goal in life is to be an agile organization. No, business agility is the goal. Business agility, flexibility, high performance is really the goal. And I want you to know that, or at least our philosophy, is that it will take a process transformation, which means that your teams will need to learn agile, scrum, lean, Kanban, engineering practices, improving requirements, gathering, fixing the process side of it. But I will tell you that organizations that have done this successfully realize that there's a lot of work on the people transformation side. Um, having managers learn servant leadership and move from commanding and controlling and dictating. Even project managers, not just resource managers, directors and executives, but your skill as a project manager, moving away from that task-focused mentality of telling people what tasks they need to get done and providing the solutions into more of an empower, a coach, a mentor. Um, facilitation skills are going to be extremely important for you as you, tra you know, move through this journey because Agile has a lot of cross-functional teams that come together, people that may not know how to work with each other very well. And so if your meetings are not going well right now, you're going to have even a bigger issue if you don't have effective facilitators because you're bringing people from different areas and you really need to be able to deliver value. We almost call our meetings working sessions now as opposed to actual meetings. Stable teams, we call them service teams, but they're really stable teams, teams that are not constantly being broken apart and shuffling and shifted and people in and out of the team. Um, high performance requires stability of a team and stability and focus. And then obviously collaboration skills, which is how am I going to get people to trust each other, talk to each other openly and honestly without being defensive, without being angry uh, and knowing how to do that in a healthy way. Um, there's a funny video you should go watch that we talk about why do people move to Agile. It's a funny video over here, so I just have the link for you that you can watch later. So um, as we talk about the Agile life cycle, and I'm sure many of you know um, if you've watched any of our previous webinars, that Agile really centers around four value statements, which is people and their collaboration over processes and tools. Working software, and if I may, if you uh, allow me, I would actually really say that this is value delivery because many of you will ask me the question, does Agile work for, for only software, only IT? And I hope by the end of this webinar that you will realize Agile is a way of organizing work. It's a way of organizing it and getting it done in a very systematic way. Um, so it's not just applied to software. Yes, unfortunately, a lot of the original books that were created and published and the case studies were related to software, but um, you can use Agile to uh, plan a wedding, plan anything. So we'll talk about that. Um, these are all what we call value drivers. People in their collaboration, delivering value, getting the customers involved, and responding to change. This is what we call value drivers. These things over here we do need. They do have value. We do need processes and tools. We do need documentation. Absolutely need to have some contracts with the customers. And of course we need a plan. But what we're saying is that over the years, we have focused on these management controls more than we have focused on actually delivering value. And we'd like to swing the pendulum a little bit more here 
and do just enough of these items to deliver value if that makes sense so absolutely need these items we're not saying let's go let's let you know we're not going from one extreme to the other but we do need to focus on delivering value um, we won't have time to go through all the agile principles in this webinar but I do want you to know that the agile principles are the heart of agile a lot of companies that we coach even after years of doing agile uh, when we start to see that their teams are deteriorating and not doing it well, we realize that they're actually missing some of these principles. For example, they're not working together daily. They have lost the value of face-to-face -face conversation. And even if you're a distributed team, I would challenge you, you still can have face-to-face -face via video conferencing. We, we use technology to bridge that gap. Um, we are not, for example, moving away from creating motivated individuals and trusting them. We're still using command and control, for example. So I've, I've been into Agile companies that say they're doing Agile, but when I really look at it, it's what I call checklist Agile. They've got the stand-up meeting, they've got the post-it notes on the wall, they've got this, they've got that, but they really have forgotten the heart of the principles and the values. So I hope you do take some time to understand and learn those in more detail because um, they're really what makes Agile work. Um, I've also been into large companies that have used Agile to burn out people, um, where it's just become what I call the meat grinding machine. Get it done, get it done, get it done, get more points done. And they've forgotten that we say we talk about sustainable pace. And sustainable development means that we are working in a high product productivity manner, but it's consistent and it's tolerable. It's not this huge ups and downs that we're accustomed to. So it's a constant pace that we are able to deliver value from indefinitely. Um, again, to understand agile versus traditional, uh, traditional requirements, get, uh, traditional processes such as waterfall, really assume incorrectly that you can fix your requirements, that you can fix the scope. And that's a lot of what our uh, plans have been focused on in the agreements and what we are signing on is that we can fix the requirements. But because we do that and we focus on that, what ends up being an estimate and what ends up changing is the cost or the schedule, right? Um, and of course, I'm sure you've been in many companies that want to fix all three of them, fix requirements, fix cost, fix, fix schedule. I just, I haven't, I guess, uh, met many uh, that have been able to do that very well. So what Agile says is, you know what, instead of being so plan driven, and, and fixing the requirements, why don't you just tell me what your cost is or what your schedule is? If you have a specific budget that you don't want to go above, tell me what that is. Or if you have a drop dead date uh, for this project, tell me what that is. And of course I need you to probably have high level requirements of what we're trying to deliver. But both of us would benefit, the customer and the team would benefit from constantly focusing on what are the highest value requirements that we need to deliver by this cost or by the state. So what we realize in Agile is requirements really are never 100% fixed. And even though the high-level scope is probably fixed, the detailed stories, and, you'll, and I'll walk you through a little bit what we mean by a story, the detailed stories are never really fixed. And I know you're probably thinking in your head, no, Sally, in our project, detailed stories are also fixed. Uh, no, trust me, I've been in all the projects that have told me, and those do end up changing how you implement the story what slice of the story you really need to get done and that's where we need that flexibility and that's why a lot of agile projects do deliver based on their cost or even ahead of schedule and what we focus on is the highest values features the highest value work instead of having someone do a brain dump up front and sign their blood away, their document away, that this is what I need, and then delivering upon that, what we say is what is important to deliver, what is the highest value item to deliver. So I know it's a different um, way of thinking, but of course I hope that you are gonna keep an open mind as we talk through um, the different mindset that Agile would require. When you're moving to Agile, and we are gonna walk through the life cycle, there are um, three different popular methods that um, you would consider. And I wanted to show you this umbrella to clarify that Lean, which comes from manufacturing, from Toyota, and Agile really are what I call the umbrella. They, they give you the values and the principles that we believe in. So many of you that work in the manufacturing world would know that Lean is all about cutting waste, optimizing the whole flow, right? Um, limiting capacity to uh, limiting work in progress to what we can actually really get done. Um, and it's worked very well in manufacturing. It has succeeded for years. Um, Agile and Lean got married because Agile basically said, hmm, 
since lean has worked so well in the manufacturing world, why don't we take some of these best practices and apply them to project execution and how we get work done in general? So I almost consider Agile this uh, way to optimize the whole execution life cycle of, of delivering value from projects to enhancements to support just to getting work done. Um, so Agile and Lean got married and they have three children, um, Scrum, Extreme Programming and Kanban. There are more Agile methods out there and the, the reason I'm focusing on those three is because they're the most popular ones right now. Scrum is one of the Agile methods and it gives you a lot of the project management type practices. It does more than that, but it is famous for planning meetings, daily stand-up meetings, um, the final demo, the review, and the retrospective. Uh, the burn-up charts, the burn-down charts, how you report, that all comes from Scrum, the, the wonderful Scrum Master role, the product owner role. Um, Kanban is a little bit, it's less prescriptive, prescriptive than Scrum, but Kanban is about creating visual walls, a visual way to track progress. So if you're using Kanban, um, I would expect you to have a wall that would show me um, the process, the steps that you're taking to deliver value, and where this item is in that process step. Is it in requirement? Is it in development? Is it in design? Is it in testing? Is it waiting to be picked up? So Kanban really is a wonderful, very simple way to take what you're doing today, put it up on the wall, and, it, and I know some of you are distributed teams, and so you would use um, some of the online tools that would allow you to create a, vi a virtual Kanban wall, and I can give you examples of those. Um, but Kanban says, until you see it, until you make it visible, it's hard for you to optimize it. Um, because after you're visualizing the work that you're doing, you can then say, hmm, I think we have some bottlenecks over here. I think we're trying to do way too much. We need to limit our work in progress. Um, how can this team get this work done all the way to done the fastest possible way? So Kanban is amazing, and it's becoming extremely popular right now, even for companies that are afraid to go to Scrum, for example, and just want something simple to start with. Um, and many companies are mixing Scrum and Kanban together, um, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the reason I'm emphasizing those two is because they actually don't relate to software development. You can use Kanban and Scrum for any kind of project, as long as you have a backlog of work to get done. Um, you could use both of these processes. Um, of course, you can use them for IT and for software. They're popular there, too. But I just wanted to clarify that Scrum and Kanban really are not technology specific. Extreme programming, on the other hand, is an amazing method for giving us a lot of, you know, common and best practices for automated testing, test-driven development. How do I basically add more quality to the software that I am creating? And so, yes, it is very specific to software development in IT. Um, but it's what adds like that deep dose of quality to what you're really doing. So those are, I just wanted to get those terms out of the way because a lot of people get confused of what is Scrum, what is Extreme Programming, what is Kanban, how do I use them together? Um, the life cycle that I'm going to walk you through and that um, I want you to understand here is, it sort of starts with feasibility initiation. Um, and I am specifically, when I draw this picture over here, I am really talking about projects. I'm not talking about minor enhancements and support work. I will, I will talk to you a little bit later about how that integrates over here. But I'm specifically talking about when you have large initiatives or medium-sized initiatives and you have to go through this initial approval process just like you would normally do today. That's really what project feasibility initiation is about. Nothing really dramatically changes um, as you're moving to Agile. We just might give you more different techniques, lighter weight techniques, to get that done quickly. Um, and then the, the, the Agile really life cycle, once the project's approved and, and the team is pulling it into their backlog, they are ready to work on it, it really, from a team perspective, begins over here. It begins with release planning. Release planning is where the team gets together to meet with their sponsor, their product owner, and they say, okay, let's go through what you really want us to do. Let's build the backlog of all the requirements, but they're not at the detail level that you used to do before. They're down at the story level, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. Um, you have completed release planning when you have a backlog, a complete backlog of the work that needs to get done. You have prioritized it based on business value and dependency, because dependency actually trumps business value, right? So you've sequenced the backlog, you've ordered it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, top down based on dependency and value, um, and risk, obviously. You need to also think about risk. And you've sized the backlog you have an estimate of how big each item is and you finally developed a plan. Now what I'd like to do is show you an example of that. So 
this is a workbook um, that I always share with different people. This is just an example. Of course, there's a lot of Agile tools out there that work better than this Excel sheet. But here's an example of um, a backlog. And so we're going to have this web portal site. Um, this is what we call a theme. This is a feature. And these are the stories that we need to get done. They're very small. They're very specific. Um, and we've organized our backlog into profile management, place order. The right way to write the story is, as a customer, I want to search the product list so that I can find what I want. So that's a specific story that needs to get done. It's a requirement. Um, it, and it goes with the format of, as a user, I want to, here's what I need to do, so that I can find what I want. This is what we call the value proposition. And so that's the best practice, or at least the preferred way. Um, to write the stories. So you go ahead and build this backlog. Of course, this is just an example. Um, part of the backlog also includes your non-functional stories. Non-functional are the, the foundational items that you need to do sometimes before you can even get started. Um, do you have to have a test environment up and running? Do you need to um, um, re, you know, upgrade a specific system? Do you need to, if I was building a house, do I need to actually build the foundation of the house first before we can even get started? What are some of these things? Do you need to do any architecture, any design work um, that is a little bit more holistic so, to help guide you? So this is what we call non-functional stories in addition to the functional stories. Um, and all these stories have story points associated with them. And so you can easily see that this item that's an eight is bigger than an item that's a two. Um, and we'll walk, I'll walk you through what story points are here in a little bit. Um, so this is just really an example of a backlog. And um, anytime we cancel a story or we add a story, we just keep track of it. Um, so this was a new story that was added you know, to the backlog after we created it. So very simple change management. So in release planning phase, in that phase, I would expect you to have your backlog created, um, have it somewhat prioritized uh, or ranked one, two, three, four, five, and have it sized. And then finally, maybe have something that looks similar to this. It doesn't have to be mapped out all the way, but this is what we call a release plan. And the release plan says, look, we're, we're going to have to have an iteration zero or a setup iteration. And um, going back to the picture over here, this is what iteration zero is, is after we're done planning, we do need to go through an iteration zero, a setup to get some of the stories that are non-functional, that are foundational, um, get some training, get some basic stuff done before we can just execute. So this was our view here of iteration zero, right? Iteration zero, here's the items from that list that we need to get done. Um, and this just tells you how big and how small that item and then normally for one item to get done, there's multiple people that get it done in the team. Um, what we've done here is we've always assigned someone to be the owner. The owner is like the little mini scrum master that will make sure that this really item is coming to completion or um, basically sort of report on it um, as part of the team on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, is this really coming to completion? So some people like that. Some people say, you know what, the whole team is owning that. Um, and what we start to track is, okay, you wanted to get this done. Did you really get it done or not? At the end of our time box iteration, did you really get it done or not? So let me walk you through so you can see a full release plan. This is iteration one. Here's what we plan to get done. We targeted to get these done. After actually executing this iteration, which looks like it was a three-week iteration, um, we got some of these items done, but those two over here did not get done. Okay, so let's go down a little bit more. All of our iterations are three weeks in this example over here. Um, in Agile, your iterations could be fixed time boxes in Scrum, and they could be one week up to four weeks. But once you start with a length, we normally want you to stick with it so you can begin to understand velocity. So what is a release plan then? A release plan is your project plan. It's sort of the idea, the schedule, the rough initial plan of what do we think we can get done when. Normally none of this information would be there, the actual, because when you're done release planning, you're sort of just laying out what does this really look like? When do we think we can deliver what? Now, a lot of teams don't do it all the way until the production date. Um, some teams, they don't need to. They don't have a drop-dead deadline. They just need to come up with the plan for the next two or three iterations because they really don't have a drop-dead date. They really more have the scope needs to be completed. Um, and so they're constantly planning for the next few iterations at a time. Um, when I have a, a deadline, you know, this is just Sally right now, but when I have a project that does have a specific deadline and it's within my next six months, for example, uh, maybe I'm just notorious, but I do like to sort of sketch out with the team a draft of 
which stories do we think we can get done when. So a release plan is basically not task oriented, but more value driven. What valuable stories are you going to deliver for me? Um, and it gives the team at least a roadmap of what they can complete. And it allows me to begin to track, oh, we thought we were going to get 18 points done. Oh, we only got 10 points done. And if your company cares about cost, this is also tracking cost at the iteration level and a cumulative level. So the result of release planning should be some high level cost estimates, right? Some idea of how many iterations do we think it's going to take, knowing that it's going to change. That number will change once the team begins to execute and they give you real velocity in terms of how, how many stories they're really getting done. Um, but you basically get the idea. What, what I have seen happen, uh, which is not good in some agile teams, is they go from the extreme of, in Waterfall, this whole planning requirements gathering cycle could take you to two to three months. And what they try to do in Agile is just skip it, just begin to go ahead and execute. And so they're going from one extreme of you know, too much planning into no planning, no foundation setup. And I think that has been a problem. So what I would recommend is you know, definitely you need to put some time for release planning. For Typically for us, if it's like a six month project, we normally allocate a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks maximum, to get through a lot of the planning activities, build the full backlog, have the team engaged, through all of this. And again, the planning is done by the entire team and the product owner. Um, um, so the sizing really comes from the team, from the, from the cross-functional team, as opposed to traditionally where it would just be the business analyst or the analyst gathering requirements and then some superior developers or architects or someone who's a subject matter expert would provide the estimates. In this case, it's very much a collaborative effort. Um, iteration zero is again where we do some of the foundational work that we've scheduled and usually it's time box iteration, could be three weeks. Um, uh, but what I always say about iteration zero so it doesn't take forever, it's just enough to make iteration one succeed. Just enough for our next iteration to succeed. So I don't need the production environment set up yet. You know, I need at least the test environment set up before the team can actually execute. Some of these other items you can do within the iterations. So you're done with release planning, you're done with iteration zero, you begin to iterate. You begin to do these iterations or sprints, and this is specifically if you're doing Scrum. Um, if you're using Kanban, which Kanban does allow you to not have sprints, you don't have to have these time boxes. Um, items are just flowing in and out, and typically that's really used when you've got maintenance, support, enhancements, operational business work, a lot of these small items that just continue to come in, you might not need a whole you know, fixed time box to do that. Uh, but for many of our projects that we've seen, Scrum has worked very well because it forces a planning meeting at the first day of the sprint. Every single day, the team gets together and checks to see how things are going um, and answers three questions. And then at the end, my favorite, it's the show me, <laughs> what did you really get done? It's our sprint review and retrospective meeting that has to happen at the end of that two or three week cycle. So within the sprint, there's daily build, documentation, integration, code reviews, design reviews, um, continuous testing, um, and most importantly, pre-planning for the next iteration. What I mean by that is, um, for example, if you are in this iteration over here, iteration one, and the team is executing and trying to get this work done, Part of your job and your work in iteration one is to look ahead at some of the stories that you had planned for the next iteration. So as a customer, I want to search the product list so I can find what I want. That was a deliverable. Um, I have to begin to plan those in this iteration. We, we really, uh, that has been a best practice. And if you don't do it that way, you end up really churning in the next iteration. So what we've typically recommended is in iteration one, even though the team is getting this done, and of course you've already had requirements for that, go ahead and have a subset of the team begin to get detailed requirements for the stories that are coming up so that when we come to that planning meeting, we already know what needs to get accomplished, right? So that's what we mean by pre-planning, getting ready for the next iteration planning meeting instead of coming in and not knowing what you need to get done. So, um, after you iterate, you can pre-release pr and move to production. There are some teams that will move to production right away. After every sprint, they get the work done and they just move it and release it right away. Um, but your, your release plan would show you that, would show you sort of how frequently do you really want to release. And obviously, Agile would advocate more frequent releases when possible. Um, some people 
do get uh, what I would call iterative and incremental confused with each other. So a lot of people think, well, there's no way Agile would work for us, Sally, because we can't release that frequently. We, we can only release once every six months, and so Agile wouldn't work. Well, that's sort of not what we're talking about. If you want to release once every six months, fine, if that's what the business needs. What we're saying is that within those six months, you should have several iterations that deliver value, maybe to a test environment, maybe to a staging environment, until they're ready to move to production in six months. Um, if that's the only way the business works is that you can only release once every six months. Um, so iterative development is really about getting work ready and um, all the way to done done, but moving it maybe to a test environment and making it potentially shippable. Not necessarily it has to move to production. So many teams have multiple iterations that they go through before they actually release something. Now let's talk about requirements in Agile. Um, we really want you to break down, um, uh, and there's another webinar that we've done before called you know, Deep Dive into Requirements Gathering, so I hope you go back and watch that. But when you have this large initiative or this big project, we want you to break it down, and generally speaking, we call them themes. Themes are these big epics that need to get done. A theme has multiple features, and a feature has multiple stories, and a story has details. Typically, when we say requirements um, in traditional projects, honestly, I don't know what level we're talking about. Everyone's version of a requirement depends on their own perspective. So if you talk to the business, they think they're giving you requirements when they're talking at this high level, right? This theme and this feature. I need, um, here's an example, I need a claims management system and I want to be able to manage my claims. They might think that's a requirement. But from our perspective, we'd say, all right, claims um, is a good theme under our member portal feature, uh, sorry, area or initiative. And a feature might be manage claims, but I do need to know the stories. An example of a story, as a member, I want to view my current unpaid claims. As a member, I want to view the details of a claim. Those are both deliverables, and I know this is a software example, but I'll show you in a little bit an example that's non-software. So those are stories, which means there are specific scenarios that we do need to accomplish under managed claims. The details, like acceptance criteria, for example, verify that only pending claims are listed on this page, verify that claims are listed by date in ascending order, and verify that all claims for dependents appear on the list. Those are the details. Those are the very detailed business rules. We want those. Those are good. But those are one level below our story, and we only gather those just in time. So when we're saying at the very beginning of your project, you're building a backlog of stories, you're really wanting to get to this level. If you start getting all this level of detail for each story, then you're pretty much doing waterfall requirements gathering, which is deciding on where the field's going to be on the screen, what exactly is going to be on the drop down, what color should the paint be on this house inside this room. Those are the details. We want to gather those one iteration or two iterations before this requirement gets done. Okay, and that's why we can do all of our requirements gathering in Agile in two to three weeks maximum um, to build the backlog because we're not going into that level of detail. I know what you're thinking. Um, so if you're not getting to that level of detail, Sally, then how are you sizing the project? We'll, we'll work through that. Um, here's an, again, an example of a backlog. So uh, requirements, just like you saw. And here's an example of a non-IT backlog. Let's say your project is around qualifying vendors, okay? has nothing to do with IT, you're trying to pick between two, three different vendors. And that's a lot of work that you're going to have to do over the next six months or four months. And so what I've got broken down for you over here is, let's just say vendor selection is its own theme. There's a whole bunch of work related to vendor selection. And contracting, finally getting the contract and, and, and doing some of that work is its own deliverable. And then finally, integrating and, and, and execution with the vendor is its own sort of area or theme. In that case, I can take vendor selection and say, all right, as the XYZ department, we want to develop an RFP that we were going to submit for vendor selection so that our needs and qualifications are shared with the potential vendors. So developing the RFP is now a deliverable. Now, is this really a story or do I need to break it down further? The question I would ask you is, can you develop the whole RFP within an iteration? Can you, within the next two to three weeks, get the whole RFP done? If your answer to me is, yep, Sally, this is a very simple RFP, we can get the whole thing done in the next two to three weeks, then that's great. Then this becomes a story, you can put it in your backlog, and these are just really tasks related to the story. 
But let's say you say, oh no, developing the RFP is going to take another two months because there's so much work related to that. Then I'm going to say, all right, let's just consider this a deliverable and it's still an epic. It still needs to be broken down. It's a feature. Can you break it down for me? And you say, well, yeah, we first have to develop and brainstorm the list of categories to include in the RFP. Um, I got to figure out who the stakeholders and departments and invite them. And then I do need to include from every area their questions and the requirements um, in the RFP. We finally need to have a draft RFP, not RFT, sorry, RFP available. And then we have to finally um, get consensus. Those would be the big sub deliverables or valuable milestones to get to that RFP. Then build your backlog based on these items and then tell me which iteration are you going to get which items done. Okay, so there's an example that I want to share with you of non-IT. You're just taking the work that you've got today that you need to get done. You're breaking it down into smaller valuable deliverables. And once the deliverable, I mean, once the size of the deliverable is small enough that it can get done within the next iteration, then it's okay. It's a story, right? Um, but that's what we care about in Agile is we take what we call the big elephant, the big monster, and we break it down into small deliverables that are still valuable in nature. So the traditional way, project manager, um, this is really the waterfall way. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But there's a lot of handoffs between the requirements team, getting the requirements, finally sending it to someone who designs it. Finally, they hand it off to developers. Developers send it over to testers. Finally, it gets testing by the customer, and we develop the, the, the actual final product. In Agile, we're basically saying, take that requirements list that you had. Give me a, a linear backlog, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't even want high, medium, low anymore because everything's going to end up being high, right? So just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Get that team that used to work in such a silo and put them together, whether it's physically putting them together or logically, virtually. Let them feel and know that they are actually a team. They have to work together as a team. They need to know each other. They need to not have these formal processes that stop their communication with each other. Get this person called the product owner, who typically in traditional um, projects we didn't really have because we had this high-level sponsor or the business lead that wanted us to get the project done. And quite frankly, they weren't very engaged. They sort of had the project manager run with the whole thing. Um, in Agile, we think, no, if you're from the business and you went and justified this project and you said that you need to get this done, uh, you need to come part of, be part of the party. Okay, you, you need to be engaged. Uh, you need to come and make sure that you're giving us feedback. Um, and this shouldn't really come as a surprise to you because the example that I always give of this is uh, if any of you out there have built your own home, if you've built your own house, I guarantee you, you went down to the house and took a look at it every single day, if not every single week, at least minimum. You wanted to see what is being done in your own home. You wanted to give feedback. If I told you that I was going to build your house and not show you the house until it was all done, and then we had this big testing phase for you at the very end, I don't think you would jump on board with me being that builder. So that's exactly what we're saying. Product owner, come, be engaged, watch over, make sure this process is healthy, that we're delivering value for you. Um, Scrum master, no longer you are not in charge of making decisions for the team or providing solutions. You are a process facilitator. You are someone who needs to make sure this team is healthy and getting things done in the right way and being empowered. And you're protecting the team from all these outside disturbances of other people wanting them to get different things done. Um, and we call the team over here the committed people. Their neck is on the line for getting the work done. And these are the interested. Um, and yes, some people call these chickens and some people call these pigs. Um, law, there's a joke out there, but unfortunately we don't have time uh, within our webinar. But that's sort of the scrum way or the agile way. We take these requirements and um, we put them into... I got to get the animation to work because I spend a lot of time on it. There you go. Cool, huh? All right, you got to take these requirements and you put them in these sprints and we get those uh, work done that way. So that's really the basics of, of uh, how we're doing it. Then, as everyone's getting their requirements done um, and showing done, and remember done in Agile means done as in approved by the product owner. Product owner says, yes, I have tested this and it works. It's exactly what I want. It doesn't mean that it's moved to production but it does mean that it's potentially movable to production. So as the, the team begins to sprint, 
and go through this, they're starting to accumulate points, right? And so we can basically starting to measure those points. The day in the life of a sprint looks like this. We start with a sprint planning meeting. We get people to talk about, oh, look, we've got this eight pointer and this three pointer. What are we going to do? What tasks do we need to create to actually get this work done? So the planning meeting typically half a day. Um, and the team really sits together and says, here's what we're going to get done in the next two weeks. And here's, let's make sure we ask the, uh, the product owner questions. We really understand what they really want. They're sitting right here in front of us. We're gathering the requirements, the details from them. Um, if you've done it correctly, if you remember what I just said, when you came to the sprint planning meeting, you should have already had the product owner, probably your analysts and a couple of other people, write the detail requirements for the stories that are in this iteration. So that when you're coming into this meeting, it's not the, uh, what is it that you want? And everyone's sort of confused on what the requirements should be. So that pre-planning would really help with this. Every day, we have a daily stand-up meeting and it's only 15 minutes and the team, it is not a status reporting meeting and the team goes through and um, talks story by story or person by person. Um, I will be honest with you and again this is not a standard yet in the industry the, the standard is that person by person you would say what did I complete yesterday, what did I work on today and what is slowing me down? What impediments do I have? And uh, you're really just sharing that with your whole team as it relates to getting these work done. Um, I will share with you a best practice that a lot of our teams do is we also go story by story. Instead of going person by person, we alternate day after day and we'll just look at the top priority story and we'll try to figure out what will it take to get that story to done and who do we need from the team to help get that story done. So we actually have people recruit each other and say, all right, John, you're working on story number five and that's actually not very important compared to story number one. Can I have you jump up over here and help me get story number one done? So the story by story stand up has been very effective for us in addition to the task or the, the person by person. At the end of the iteration or the sprint, um, Tom Cruise, who's famous for his show me the money, comes in and says, show me a story that is done. Show me something that actually got accomplished. Don't show me a status report. That's why Agile is used so frequently right now to reduce risk because at the end of every two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, whatever your iteration is, the team has to actually show something. They can't just have a status report. So Agile really adds this huge layer of visibility, which in my opinion reduces the risk dramatically. Um, and we do that even for large, large projects. Actually, I think this visibility is even needed more for large projects. So that's the quick review, the, the, the demo, people call it the demo, people call it the sprint review. Um, and immediately after that sprint review, we have our retrospective and we got to talk about what's working well and what needs to be improved because we honestly believe that if you don't ask that question every sprint, if you wait until the end of the project to do your project uh, post-mortem, um, it's too late. It's too late to fix anything. So this is where the team openly and honestly talks about, hey, our team dynamics are not working well. We're not talking to each other well. We're not communicating. The product owner is not engaging with us. Hey guys, those requirements that you wrote for us, they're not detailed enough. We're not able to execute. Uh, we're really struggling with not having a test environment. Um, any impediments is what the team begins to figure out. How can we do this better next time? And that's really the heart of Agile, is this continuous predictable process of planning, daily visibility, show me what you got done, improve the process. And that's really the, the scrum framework, right? The scrum framework says do this over and over and over again um, using this team. So, um, and again, this is specifically to what we, what we advocate or what we teach. Um, the, the roles within scrum really are just three roles. There's a scrum master, there's a product owner, there's the team. Those are the three scrum roles. The reason I like to show it in a triangle is because I want you to know that a team will absolutely churn and not get anything done if any part of this leadership triangle is broken. There needs to be someone from the business or from the customer side who can give me the vision of what we need to work on and why. So that's their leadership role is they have to lead the vision of what needs to work on and why. There needs to be someone, the scrum master, a team member who's playing this role, a project manager who's becoming the scrum master who has to take leadership over the process. 
So people can't just skip out of meetings, people can't just not get anything done. The whole accountability for the whole process, and it's not just the team, it's protecting the team from the outside people that want to screw up and maybe um, have the team do things that they're not supposed to work on or pull them off the team or have them work on other things that were not on the backlog. Someone has to maintain process leadership, and that's who our Scrum Master or Process Facilitator is. One or two or three people from within the team need to be technical experts. They, you can't have a team that's getting something done that doesn't have anyone who knows how we get this work done. So someone has to have the technical vision. Um, sometimes it's an architect, sometimes it's a couple people from within the team, it could be team leads, but someone needs to know how do I translate this vision of what the business wants into a high level vision of how. And then we empower the team to figure out how they're really going to execute from a task perspective. Who's going to do what, how they're going to get it done, and what they can actually commit to is really the role of the team, right? So a team is absolutely broken if this triangle is broken. But if this triangle is healthy, then this team most likely will be a healthy team because they know what they need to get done. They understand the process. They understand high level how the vision, and then they can self-organize around getting that work done. Um, this, when you download these slides, you'll get a little bit more definition on the product owner role, the team role. I am going to skip those right now because um, we've, we've talked a little bit about them in terms of what's expected, but I did want to share that with you so that when you download them, you understand in more detail what we expect of the scrum master, the product owner, and the actual team members themselves. Um, what you may not know in Agile is that a team shouldn't be large. We don't want a team of 50 people. Uh, so, typically when we have large projects, we still split them into small teams that are 7 plus or minus 2. Um, I've had teams of 10 people, maybe 11. Once you start getting to a team that's got 15 people, trust me, they're not going to work as this high-performing team anymore because they're going to create many silos. Um, and we do want the team to be generalizing specialists, which means they're all in it f to succeed. They're, it's not about my task or your task. It's about getting the actual story to done. Um, I w yes. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate that. Um, a team, a multi-team program view shows you that now that you sort of understand how this team needs to have a backlog and sprints and execute, when I have a program, and a program is really defined, or a scrum of scrum, as a project or an initiative or a product that requires multiple teams to get it done, then we normally structure the teams this way. They all have product owners, they all have the same leadership triangle, but I need a program leadership team that includes the, the, the chief product owner or the sponsor, um, a program manager, or think of them as a scrum master, but they facilitate the overarching program. And then obviously someone over here who's looking over the entire program from an architectural and um, technical vision, how are we going to get the work done? This program, Scrum of Scrum or leadership team, is very critical. I've seen too many companies try to attempt to do Agile at scale, but not realize that I have to have this team, and they have a backlog of probably not down to a story level, but probably more at the theme and the feature level. Um, and they have a roadmap of which team is going to deliver what when at a high level, so they can begin to guide those teams. Um, another best practice when you're doing this is don't create the teams to where they have so much dependency on each other. Try to have every team be able to finish something beginning to end. So make sure that the roles within the team, instead of having a front end team and a back end team, um, see if you can have enough front end and back end people so they can actually get something done as opposed to every team depending on another team to get work done. Now, of course, because it's a program, there is some level of integration and dependency that needs to be structured, and that's really the role of the program leadership team is um, what are the dependencies between the team? When can we integrate the work that they're doing together? Um, what does it look like at a high level? And this wall, in my opinion, the program wall, is one of the most important walls to have as a visual um, using maybe a Kanban wall or even electronic wall. Um, portfolio. So when we're implementing Agile at scale, when we're really trying to take this to organizations that want to do this as a way of, of, of working, then we basically start deploying teams, program teams, but also portfolio management teams that may be on top of multiple programs, multiple teams. 
Um, this is beyond the scope of today's webinar because uh, we're just going through the Agile life cycle, but I did want to share this with you. And we have other webinars um, such as the Transforming to Agile PMO that you can watch. Um, I'm going to finish up over here so I can take some questions, but velocity is an important concept that I want you to understand, uh, which is as the team begins to execute, you're now able to figure out how much can they really handle? What's their capacity? So, for example, this team's been executing, and I can say that their average velocity is about 12 points. That's a very important number. 12 points means that if I have 48 points to get done, that's roughly four to five sprints. That's something that we can't answer very easily today based on just your hour estimates. So that's why velocity in Agile is like the heart of estimation. Once a team begins to execute, I can figure out their average velocity, which is how many points are they really getting done. From that number, I can begin to predict how many iterations will it take. Um, so if it's perfect execution, if there are no impediments, this team should have gotten the 48 points done, you know, probably within um, uh, four sprints or so. But in, in reality, we added one more sprint, so it really took five sprints to really get this done um, after we buffered some of our sprints. Um, points are just relative to each other, guys. Really don't confuse yourself and feel like these need to be precise estimates. Points are just a way to say, is it smaller? Is it bigger than the other item? Uh, if I told you I've got a grape, I've got an apple, and I've got a watermelon, and I said, give me points for those, you would obviously tell me a grape would either probably be a one or a two because it's very small, an apple might be medium because it's a little bit bigger, a watermelon is really big, so it might be a large or very large. That's really how we're sizing. We're trying to avoid precision because precision's never worked. A lot of the time you're spending trying to get to precise hour estimate, it's a waste of time. It really is. We just don't think it's feasible. You know, you're going to be really way off anyway. So why not use what we call more relative sizing and then watch the team's velocity? Um, and I know your question is going to be, well, how am I going to know how long it's going to take? Once we have the backlog and we know the team's velocity, we can predict how many sprints it takes to get work done. That's how we estimate and we provide a cost estimate. Um, this is also a chart that's very popular that everyone loves to see. Your business would love to see this chart. What are you getting done for me, right? The blue line is what the team thought they were going to get done. The pink line is what they're actually getting done. And the line above over here is the scope. So how many points total did I have in my backlog? Every time you're adding items to the backlog, whether it's the team or the product owner, I'm just tracking the line to show here's my scope for the project and here's what we're actually getting done. No point will be put on this chart until it's done done. Done means that the product owner has actually accepted it. And then I think your customer would be very interested to know, well, what's the cost of my project? And by the way, this one comes from that Excel sheet that I just showed you. So if you're really tracking the release plan over here and you're tracking the cost by iteration, then there's this burn up chart that you could pretty much start to communicate um, with your product owners or your customers in terms of what's really getting done when. Um, this is a day in the life of an Agile Team cheat sheet, and you will also be able to download this from the zip file. It just takes you through that one sprint, and I have some uh, cheat sheets here for you in terms of what does the planning meeting really look like, uh, the design review. This is very specific to um, a software project, but you can obviously think about you know how you would use it for even non-software. But this is sort of the ceremonies, the meetings, and my recommendations for you in terms of what you could do when and what meeting to facilitate this well. So I'm going to ready to take questions. Um, you can download the zip file that I've created for you that has this PDF, it has the workbook that you just saw, and it also has that cheat, the last cheat sheet from tinyurl slash agile training. And I do hope that you go out and watch some of our agile videos. There's a ton of free videos that your company can watch um, um, or subscribe to from, from a learning perspective. Uh, so let me go ahead and see some of your questions. Um, I think your agile knowledge and experience is very critical and understanding that this is a transformation. So, um, and I think you're talking specifically at the scrum master level, I hope, um, it needs to be someone who's had experience. Just having a certified scrum master certification doesn't do it for you. It's really someone who is um, a servant leader, who understands agile, who understands how to 
have the confidence and the courage to block a lot of the impediments that are going to be coming into the team and to educate everyone on the whole agile process. Um, so from an organizational perspective, you know, my opinion is some leader, someone at the leadership level needs to understand the value proposition behind agile and support it so that it could really be done both top down and bottom up. Uh, most companies that fail with agile, my opinion, Francis is they haven't learned it the right way. They, they've picked up a book, they're doing it, they're learning as you go, and they really don't have anyone helping them who's an expert um, at implementing it. And very quickly, they revert back to what they were doing before, which is either command and control, not knowing how to break down requirements into small chunks, um, not knowing how to deal with distributed teams. So I would say education is critical to the success of agile. Um, and then obviously having the team have someone there to help them whether you hire that externally or internally. Um, learn agile, so training. I mean, this is what we normally do. I'm not trying to sell anything, but what we normally do is we take the initial team, a cross-functional team, including the business, through a workshop, a three-day intensive workshop, where they understand how to apply agile to their own project, okay? Then um, we have you or have them get some level of coaching for at least three iterations or three sprints. Because if the pilot fails, Agile is not going to succeed. So we always say you need to pilot Agile and make sure that this initial team that's piloting Agile really absolutely succeeds. So initial education training that applies to their own project, coaching for at least three iterations so that they know what they're doing. Um, and then once you pilot Agile on two or three or four teams, have someone who is a leader who understands that this really does work begin to devise what we call a roadmap of how are you going to scale Agile? How would you really take it into more teams? But the answer to your question is just really pilot it for now. Um, yes, uh, you could use Scrum or Kanban. Kanban is the easiest because what I would ask you to do is um, I do strategy sessions all the time with leaders and executives, right? And what we end up doing is we end up brainstorming, just like release planning, what is the strategy? What is our goal? What do we need to get done? And we create a backlog of all the initiatives and the things we need to get done in order to accomplish the strategy, right? It has nothing to do with IT. So the question that I would have for you to choose between Scrum or Kanban is, um, if you feel like, if you just put up a wall and say, all right, here's all the, the things we need to get done, and here's the steps to get them done. So typically for a strategy Kanban wall, the first one is gather more requirements on that specific strategy. What, you know, you say that you want to um, do X, Y, Z. So I need more requirements on that. I need measures for how we're going to know that that strategy succeeded. I need to develop it or break it down into small workable items and then I need to finally execute and then I need to test it to see if it's worked. So that could be your Kanban wall. Um, Scrum would just basically say, can you do that every two weeks? Can you stand in front of that wall every two weeks in a fixed time box, plan what you're going to get done, have a daily stand-up meeting, and then come to a demo and talk about how, what have you accomplished in the last two weeks or three weeks related to that strategy. Just download it from tinyurl.com slash agile training. Uh, the PDF and that spreadsheet and the cheat sheet are all downloadable, um, and that's just as a thank you for you giving us an evaluation. <laughs> I, uh, I have, uh, there's a company in, uh, in Omaha over here that actually used Agile for construction, which is really interesting. It was a combination of Agile and Lean, and they built this amazing, um, it took, I think, multiple years, but it's a huge, um, what do you even call that? It's like a retail center, it's, um, it was a lot of apartment buildings with, with shops and everything, and they said that they used um, six-week sprints. And so they definitely planned everything up front during uh, a release planning session at a high level. Um, they definitely did iteration zero, which is to set up the foundation um, for what the bridge. But then what they decided to do is to break down all their work. Um, obviously, for a bridge, you can't release in small chunks. Or maybe you can. I don't know anything about building a bridge. Uh, but what they did is they said, what can we break down into small chunks in terms of work? What can we deliver on when? And they used Agile as a way of just really organizing the work in one month increments. If it's that long of a, of a, a project, you could go with four-week sprints if that works for you in terms of planning and getting work done. 
Um, so don't know if I answered that question very well. I'm not an expert in bridge creation, but um, definitely has been used for even you know building and construction. Um, earned value management is that picture that I just showed you, the, uh, the cost and the benefit. When you really look at this chart, this is really earned value management. This is Agile EVM in action. And uh, my colleague Mike Griffiths has a wonderful chart that really combines both of those. But earned value is really about what did you deliver for me? What value have you added? And what did it cost me? And what's the variance between what you thought we were going to do versus what we actually did? So if you don't want that Excel sheet, you will, you will see that that at least gives you the beginning. Um, I think traditionally by just calculating hours, 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 there's no value to hours. Um, it's just cost. And so by using the point system in Agile and saying this is how many points you've actually delivered, at least you're getting to know what work actually got accomplished. Now in a future webinar, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of business value points. And business value points is not just a measure of what work got completed, but what actual value did that work provide, right? Did it really, did it increase revenue? Did it, you know, from a value perspective? So good question though, thanks for asking. Gabor, here's what you need to tell the business. If we were doing this using Waterfall, it would have taken me three months to gather requirements in, in a lot of details before we could really give them an estimate, right? I mean, if you're doing traditional, you're going to have a very intensive requirements gathering, get everything in detail. What we do in Agile, Gabor, if you really realize it, is instead of spending the whole three months just gathering requirements, we'll spend the first two weeks doing release planning. That gives you a high level estimate of what we think we can get done. And yes, you're absolutely right. I do need the team to iterate. So I'm actually gonna have the team go through two or three or four sprints within that same three months period that traditionally you would just be gathering requirements. I'm actually gonna have the team execute two or three or four sprints for me to see real velocity. And yes, the customer must know that after the team actually iterates, we are going to give them an updated estimate that's based on actual velocity. So our, tr our typical approach, um, Gabor, is instead of giving that initial promise of an estimate and the customer saying, oh, this can never change again, which is never the case, um, we always say, give us two weeks to do release planning. That will give you a high level estimate. And then give us two to three iterations for the team to actually execute. And I'd probably recommend more like four iterations. And that will be real velocity. And then we're going to continue to work with you on, based on that number, based on this team having 50 points per iteration, is it really logical that we're going to get your thousand points done in X number of date? Or do you need to start looking at your backlog and making different decisions? Or do we need to instantiate a new team so we can increase our velocity? Right? So that's how we talk about it is um, we do need three or four iterations of real velocity until we give you an updated estimate. Thanks so much for coming today. And make sure you come to our next webinar and make your executives come to the next one. It's about the business value and ROI of Agile methods. We actually have statistics. Um, and we have a great um, uh, person who wrote a book on this, on what is the value of Agile methods compared to traditional. So if you've got executives that you're trying to convince to go to Agile, that would be the next webinar. And you can find it on the PMI website, um, on the lead learning and education community practice um, under webinars. It's the next one that's scheduled. I think it's next week. I wish I had the date for you. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone. Thanks for joining.